All right, hello everyone. We're gonna just take a moment or two for people to filter in and uh, then we will get started. All right, welcome everyone to tonight's event, Rethinking Crime, Punishment, and Redemption in California, The Legacy of the Governors Brown, featuring Miriam Powell. My name is Michael Burroughs, and I serve as director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to thank Dr. Miriam Vivian and the CSUB Public History Institute for serving as lead organizers of tonight's event. And I also want to thank uh, California Humanities for their support of this program tonight, which is part of an event series that we are calling Humanities Beyond Bars. Despite high rates of incarceration in California's Central Valley, it occurred to us that the realities of imprisonment, imprisonment and the voices of those incarcerated are often unseen and unheard. And this lack of visibility leads to a lack of understanding regarding the scale of incarceration and importantly, the life experiences of those incarcerated. So through a series of public events, including tonight's event, we aim to increase this visibility and in turn understanding of incarceration, the history of incarceration in our state, and also the human condition of those incarcerated. It'd be a tremendous help to us tonight uh, if you'd be willing to complete a brief uh, survey from California Humanities on your experience of this event. And I'm gonna post uh, this link in the chat for you now. And if you click on that link, it will take you to the survey. You can have it open and you can complete it at any time. Uh, we will post the, the link at the end of the event as well too. Uh, but again, that helps us continue to support these events going forward and get feedback and support of this grant that sponsors tonight's event. And with that, uh, thank you again. And I'll turn things over to Dr. Miriam Vivian who will introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Vivian. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'm Miriam Rob Vivian, Professor and Chair of History here at CSUB, and I'm also Director of the Public History Institute, whose mission is essentially to explore, research, collect, preserve, and disseminate the history of our region, to engage students and the community, and to provide relevant programming such as our event this evening. I want to express my thanks to Dr. Michael Burroughs, director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics and his collaboration uh, with the Kegley Institute on this event uh, with the Cal Humanities Grant, which is, as he mentioned, uh, Humanities Beyond Bars. Uh, thank you to Cal Humanities for the grant and the Public History Institute for its efforts in planning this event. I'd also like to thank the Dean of Arts and Humanities, uh, Dr. Robert Frakes, and of course, our speaker, um, Miriam Powell. I wanna say a word about how the event will run. After my introduction of our speaker, uh, Miriam Powell will share her uh, talk and it'll be followed then by a question and answer session with the audience. The uh, Q&A function should be there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can actually begin to uh, post questions as soon as you'd like and throughout her talk. So uh, don't hesitate if during the talk a question occurs to you to go ahead and type it in. And we'll try to get to as many of these as we can at the end of her talk, okay? Uh, yours will be in the queue with others and I'll do my best to uh, get to uh, as many as I can. We are very fortunate this evening to have uh, Miriam Powell, uh, an author, journalist, and independent historian. She is currently a Radcliffe Institute Fellow researching income inequality in California. She has focused much of her research and writing on California and was for many years an award-winning journalist with the Los Angeles Times. She is also a New York Times contributing op-ed writer. Of the many topics she's addressed, one of my favorites is the peach tree adoption program that she and a group of friends are part of. This in the organic orchard of David Moss Masamoto, whose fields are southeast of Fresno and who spoke at CSUB in 2014 as part of the PHI's year long series of events commemorating John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath in its 75th year. With a lyrical writing style, she has authored several books 
including the Crusades of Cesar Chavez, a biography in 2014, which garnered her the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award and a California Book Award, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. In fact, in 2015, she shared her research about the famed labor leader at CSUB as part of the PHI's 2015 event exploring the 1968 Delano grape strike. Her latest book published in 2018 is The Browns of California, the family dynasty that transformed a state and shaped a nation, which was awarded a California Book Award and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. It is this research that provides the source for her talk this evening. We're delighted to welcome Ms. Powell back to CSUB to share her perspective on the two governors Brown and to offer her insights into their impact on criminal justice policies in California. Welcome, Ms. Powell. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks to both the Kegley Institute and the Public History Institute. And I do have a very fond feelings for the Central Valley, um, having spent a lot of time there researching my farm worker books in particular. And sorry not to be there in person, but such are the times we're in. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, this will work. Not work. Is it working? Hold on. Sorry, I did the wrong thing. Why is this not working? Are you seeing my screen? No. Yes, we see your screen. Okay, so we're good. Sorry. It's my first Zoom talk with a PowerPoint, so hopefully everything will go smoothly from now on. Um, as Dr. Vivian said, my, the, a lot of this talk is drawn from the book that I did uh, about the family, the, the, which is a, it's a history of California told through four generations of the Brown family. The talk tonight will focus on uh, the criminal justice legacies of the two governors. I will try to sort of point out certain themes that unite them, certain ways that they changed over time, and you know, look at the, the legacy of 24 years of governing by the father and son Browns, and the ways in which both their views on criminal justice changed over time, and the ways in which our views as a, as a society and as a state in California changed. Um, I, I, I do think it's it's very timely at a time when, when we are all wrestling with um, so many issues involving the criminal justice system. And it's wonderful that the Kegley Institute and the California Humanities is sponsoring this talk um, and, and, this, and this whole series. So I'm gonna start very quickly with the roots of the Brown family. This is August Shuckman, who is Jerry Brown's great grandfather. It is a portrait of him on the land in Calusa that he settled on when he crossed the plains in 1852, he was a Prussian immigrant. He settled on uh, land that became, uh, ultimately bought land that was a, an inn called the Mountain House. And this is a photo of him at the land of the Mountain House. And we'll come back to that at the very end of the story as well. Um, August Schuckman had eight children. His youngest daughter was Ida. She was sort of the outlier in the family. Many of the other of her siblings all stayed in the Calusa area. She left and went to San Francisco as soon as she could when she was 18, where she met Edmund Joseph Brown. Edmund Joseph Brown was born in San Francisco, but he was the son of Irish immigrants who had fled Tipperary during the potato famine and came to California for more opportunity and, and, and all of the reasons that California drew so many immigrants uh, both then and now. So Edmund and Joseph, Edmund Joseph and Ida began their family. They had ultimately four children. These are their, their three oldest. And the little fellow over on the left sitting on his father's shoulder is um, Edmund Gerald Brown, better known to most of us and to the entire world other than his family as Pat Brown. Um, I like this photo because I think it sort of captures um, the, the look of someone who was a politician almost from his youngest years. He grew up 
in, uh, in San Francisco, went to Lowell High School. He frequently said later on in life that he ran for the um, president of every club in his high school, even the ones in which he was not a member. Uh, and that was essentially true. He was just running for office for, for his whole life. Um, he married his high school sweetheart, Bernice Lane, who was a very um, precocious student, graduated in, from Lowell High School and went to the University of California at Berkeley when she was 14 years old. Um, and Pat and Bernice started a family. And here's a photo of their three oldest children, Barbara, Cynthia, and Jerry. Um, you, those who remember the intense stare of our formerly former governor may recognize the, the uh, to me, he looks very much in this photo as he does in many ways today. Um, but the reason I included this photo in particular is that this is a photo that Pat Brown used when he ran for the first office that he actually won, which was district attorney of San Francisco in 1943. So Jerry was born in 1938. He was five when his father ran for district attorney and was elected. And so he grew up in a home that was full of politics all of the time. Um, Pat Brown, we talk a lot now about the progressive prosecutor movement. Um, Los Angeles just elected the former San Francisco district attorney, George Gascon, who was, uh, calls himself the godfather of the progressive prosecutor movement. But I would make the case that Pat Brown was actually our first progressive district attorney. Um, and this is not, I'm not saying this entirely facetiously because one of the things that Pat Brown did as district attorney that was um, in some ways ahead of his time was to focus a lot on the youth of San Francisco and on ways to keep people out of trouble and keep them out of the criminal justice system as opposed to dealing with them when they were in it and viewing his role as purely one of, of meeting out punishment. Uh, he published a little booklet called Youth Don't Be a Chump. This is the cover and the sort of cover letter in it in which he says, as you can see, that you know, his office will always be open to the children of San Francisco. You should just walk in and you know, say that you're there to see your friend, Pat Brown. Uh, the rest of the booklet was sort of a guide to how to stay out of trouble, what were the curfews, when you know, different policies for for youth to obey, to um, stay out of the criminal justice system. It was so popular that there were 275,000 copies of it published in eight editions. Um, Pat Brown also formed a relationship as soon as he was district attorney with um, Earl Warren. And this is a photo from later on in, in both of their lives when they were on what became an annual hunting trip um, on the ranch of a friend of, of Earl Warren's in Calusa County. But the reason that Pat went to see him was because Earl Warren, when he became district attorney of Alameda County, inherited an office that had many of the same problems and sort of dysfunction that Pat Brown inherited when he became San Francisco district attorney. So he went to see Earl Warren for advice. And that was really the beginning of a friendship and a very important relationship that also shaped um, then governor, future Governor Brown's views about criminal justice. Uh, there's some wonderful correspondence between the two of them when Earl Warren was the Chief Justice. Uh, in 1950, Pat Brown ran for and was elected Attorney General of California, taking on a new kind of role in sort of broadening his sense of of the criminal justice system in the state. He often said it was the best job that he ever had because of the, the freedom and the flexibility that it gave him. And meanwhile, a little, little side, side show off um, from, from the directly criminal justice related trajectory here. Uh, many people probably remember that Jerry Brown was in the seminary in the Jesuit seminary in Los Gatos for three and a half years. And there he is in the middle of the front row. Um, he went into the seminary in 1956 when his father was attorney general and was in there for um, during the campaign that his father waged successfully to be elected governor in 1958. I wanna also just remind people of what a 
breakthrough it was for the Democratic Party, Pat Brown led a sweep of the Democrats in 1958, which was the first time that they really came to power in the state for many years. We think of California now as this incredibly blue state, but in fact, Gavin Newsom is only the fifth Democrat elected governor in modern times, and two of the other four were named Brown, and one was recalled. So um, they, they, it's just a, a good reminder of how times change and of the politics of the state. Um, he was inaugurated in, in 1959. His son was allowed to come out of the seminary on, it's for unusual to, to witness his father's inauguration. And um, just another mention of Ida Shuckman Brown, Pat's mother, Jerry's grandmother, who was there in the picture, who was a really um, important influence on the thinking of the whole family, both her son, her grandchildren. She was close to, um, to her children. She was involved in the Unitarian Church and she had very strong and instilled in her family, very strong principles about justice and, and fairness and, and racial justice in particular at a time when that was not, um, not, not that commonly discussed. So as governor, Pat Brown had an enormous impact on the state in a time when it was building in many ways. And although he was very proud of his role in, 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 in promoting the University of California and the water system that was built during his, um, during his governorship, he often said when he was asked what his greatest accomplishment was, that it was his appointments to the California Supreme Court. He was very close to judges he appointed in general. He um, maintained friendships with them for his entire life, uh, but his impact was particularly great on the California Supreme Court. And here are three of the key figures during that era. Roger Traynor, who was on the court when Pat Brown became governor, but um, Brown elevated him to be Chief Justice of the court in 1964. And then he appointed both Stanley Mosk and Matthew Tobriner, um, who are renowned jurists and, and played a, a really significant role in making California's Supreme Court into um, one of the, the, the most highly respected courts in the country at that time. It was very progressive. The Trainer Court issued decisions on things like um, uh, overturning the state's ban on interracial marriage as you know, in declaring that interracial, that the, that the ban violated the 14th Amendment of the Constitution decades before the US Supreme Court did that. And also um, some really path breaking decisions on the uh, banning police from using evidence that was obtained illegal, illegally. And in general, there were a series of progressive decisions on consumer rights and criminal justice issues. Um, this is kind of a long quote, but I thought it was important to sort of give a sense of, um, of why the California Supreme Court is so important in terms of being proactive and um, uh, just read it. It takes boldness to turn a flashlight upon an aurora and call out what, has, what one has seen. Um, or, um, oh, ah, sorry about that. Uh, at the risk of violent equality for the benefit of those who have retired from active thought. It is easier for a court to rationalize that less shock will result if it bides its time and bides it and bides it while it awaits legislative action to transfer an unfortunate precedent unceremoniously to the dump from the fading glory in which it has been basking. You can see that Justice Trainer was also a good writer, but the point of this is that, that he really shapes the court into something that is a proactive force. Um, okay. uh, the other significant issue that um, Pat Brown confronts over the, not only over his governorship, but over the course of his life, and then also uh, confronts his son and is still an important topic in California, which and that is the death penalty. And so when Pat Brown was elected, um, he had as district attorney in San Francisco prosecuted death penalty cases. He had qualms about the death penalty when he became attorney general and asked for a five-year moratorium, which um, was not, did, did not happen. Um, but when he became governor, 
he inherited the case of Carol Chessman. People may remember Chessman. He was the red light bandit he was known as uh, because he shined a red light in the car of couples who were on lover's lanes and then uh, robbed them at gunpoint and in two cases at least raped women. Because he had taken one of the women from her car into his, he was convicted on a kidnapping charge that was then a capital punishment offense. That was, it was um, subsequently overturned, but it was the one um, crime that you could be convicted of and sent to death row that was, did not involve murder. And Chessman, both because his, he had not killed anyone and because he was a very charismatic figure who protested his innocence throughout um, his trials and all of his time on death row, he became a real an international symbol for the fight over the death penalty and attracted tremendous support um, for his cause from people around the world. He wrote best-selling books. He also managed to prolong his case for I think it was 11 years, which nowadays is not any, anything particularly of record, but at that time was an unusually long time to be on death row. Uh, when Pat Brown became governor, Chessman had essentially exhausted almost all of his appeals. And so he was sentenced to die on February 19th, 1960. Um, Brown had a lot of qualms about this. He really wanted to find a way to commute his sentence, but he could not do that without the permission of the California Supreme Court. And he knew that he would, could not get that, their approval. So he really sort of had no alternatives. The execution was set. And at the last minute, he was alone in the governor's mansion. He had sent his wife and daughter to Squaw Valley for the opening of the 1960 Olympics. Uh, and his son, Jerry Brown, who had recently come out of the seminary and left the seminary and was a student at the University of California at Berkeley, called him up and sort of urged him to find a way to spare Chessman's life. And against all of the advice from all of his advisors, um, Pat Brown granted a 60 day reprieve during which he would ask the legislature to overturn the death penalty, which he knew was a, a futile cause. Um, this ended up, and then Chessman ended up being executed in May of 1960. Um, this earned Brown sort of anger on all sides. The people who were again, opposed to the death penalty were angry that Chessman was put to death. The people who were in favor of the death penalty were angry that Brown had dragged this out. He got a reputation for being a, a tower of jello and being indecisive. And he felt with some justification that this dogged him for the rest of his career and that he never really overcame the um, the, 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 the bad feelings and the, the, the negative publicity that was generated by the Chesman case. Uh, although, you know, he did come back to defeat Richard Nixon in 1962 and win a second term. Um, and then was defeated by Ronald Reagan in 1966. Um, after his time in office, um, uh, later, many years later, I mean, the, the, the whole issue of the death penalty still preoccupied Brown tremendously. He went to visit death row. He talked also to some of the inmates whose cases he had ended up commuting. Um, ultimately, there were 60 prisoners on death, death row when he left office. Also a reminder of a, a time when death row was, was in the prison system in general was a fraction of the size that it is now. Um, he ended up commuting 23 sentences and senten sentencing or sending 36 men to their deaths in the, uh, uh, in, in, at, San Quentin, at San Quentin. And he wrote this book with the help of a, a writer to revisit those cases and to really think through his philosophy about the death penalty and ultimately comes to the conclusion that it is wrong, not even primarily on moral grounds, but because it is not an effective deterrent against punishment. Um, okay, we're gonna fast forward now to the next Brown. Um, Ronald Reagan comes in as governor uh, for eight years. And meanwhile, Jerry Brown graduates from the University of California at Berkeley, goes to Yale Law School, 
returns um, to California, does a clerkship, and moves to Los Angeles with the idea of entering politics, just as his father had. He runs for the first office that is available, which is the Los Angeles County uh, Community College Board. From there, becomes Secretary of State in 1970, and in 1974, runs for governor against a field of quite seasoned, um, experienced Democrats, wins the primary. Uh, this is a, a scene of him campaigning during that 1974 campaign, um, is elected. This is the post Watergate generation. He's elected, he becomes a national symbol in some ways of the new young generation. He's 36 years old and he comes into office to shake things up and to disturb the status quo in many ways. And not the least of those uh, is the judicial system. The, um, uh, I talked about Pat Brown's Supreme Court appointments, but you know he made, of course, hundreds of appointments to lower courts. At that time, the lower courts were almost all um, run by white men. The judiciary was extremely homoge homogene homogeneous. Um, and Jerry Brown comes in as part of this new wave with a sort of um, a, a really a very personal mandate to change that and a belief that government should look like the governed and should reflect the governed. Um, and in his first year in office in 1976, half of the judges that he appointed were either black, Latino, Asian American, or women. He had spent one year, his first year out of law school, clerking for Justice Matthew Tobriner, whom his father had put on the court. And he found that his experience in the Supreme Court was not, as he later said, uh, he did not find it to be a yeasty environment. And that influenced his own decisions in terms of who he appointed to, uh, to the court and later on to the Supreme Court, which we'll get to in a minute. But another influence on him was his, the, the year that he, or the months, I'm sorry, that he spent living in the mansion while his father was governor when he was studying for the bar. And I'm gonna play, hopefully if this will work, a short clip of uh, Jerry Brown at a conference at Yale Law School, his alma mater, where he discusses his thoughts about, um, about the bar. Pretty good. Now, th that's the only time I think someone's been recalled. Uh, I want to say something else about selection. Um, that uh, when I was uh, studying for the bar, living in the governor's mansion, um, after my father would go to bed, I would come downstairs and open his briefcase and read the various materials that he was taking home from the office. And there was an index file on judicial candidates. And in this, on these file cards, you'd have the names of prospective candidates. And then you'd have various advisors that would rate the candidates. Mm -hmm. And I would notice that one of the raters was Warren Christopher. Mm -hmm. I noticed sometimes he would give an A to somebody, but there were other raters that would give the same person a C or a D. Now some of those other people I probably shouldn't say this, but they were involved in getting people elected mm. and involved in those activities that are very crucial to campaigns. And so I, I, that it really struck me that some people could be both a C and an A depending upon what values you were trying to maximize. And that certainly does go into the, to the process of, of appointing. I've appointed about... <laughs> Okay, um, so his appointments reflected that desire to really shake things up and to change, um, as I said, the, the form of the judiciary. And he appointed to the California Supreme Court, the first woman, the first black, and the first Latino, Cruz Reynoso, Wiley Manuel, 
and Rose Bird. And most people have probably heard of Rose Bird or people of a certain age in California have heard of Rose Bird. Um, Rose Bird was a, a really very, very interesting a pioneering woman. She had been the first woman law clerk on the Nevada Supreme Court, the first female public defender in Santa Clara County, and then the first woman to be a, uh, to hold the rank of a cabinet secretary when Jerry Brown appointed her as the Secretary of Agriculture. And then in 1977, he not only appointed her to the court, but he appointed her uh, as Chief Justice. Um, there, this was a, a troubled tenure for many reasons, which we can get into in questions if people are, asked, are interested. Um, but ultimately, Roseburg was not, she was not recalled, but when she had to run for a full term in 1986, she and Cruz Reynoso and a third appointee of Jerry Brown were all uh, denied their, their positions on the court. Um, this allowed Brown's successor, George Duke Majin, a fairly conservative Republican to appoint conservatives to the court, utterly changed the complexion of the Supreme Court. And uh, Brown has talked about this in retrospect that it showed him that if you went too far in one direction, it might have the opposite effect of what you were trying to do. Um, so while, while many people, when they think about Jerry Brown in his first terms and his appointments to the court, think of Rose Byrd and view that kind of as a failure because she was ultimately um, replaced by, by far more conservative judges, uh, I think it's really important to remember his legacy in terms of his impact on the rest of the courts in California, which are enormous. California has um, uh, more state judges than, than it, I, I think, the, the number is um, used to be more, they, at that time, there were three times as many judges in California as the entire federal system. And his, his diversifying of the bench, which now we, is something we take for granted, but was really quite revolutionary at the time by appointing people who not only were of different races and genders and ethnicity, but also who did not come, who came from different walks of life, who were public defenders, uh, who, were, who came from business, who didn't necessarily come out of prosecutors' offices. Um, once you open that door, we did not go back as a state. And I think, you know, we've only to sort of look at the recent past to see how important judicial appointments are um, in, in this country and, and certainly in the state of California. So the other like really major, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot this. Um, this was a, a piece that, that Brown wrote during the campaign to recall Justice Byrd, where he talks about how she was sig signaled out, not because her decisions were significantly different from those of her predecessors or many of her colleagues. Um, and and there, he does not say this explicitly in this commentary, but there certainly was a major element of sexism involved um, in, in the court at that time. Um, the other really major criminal justice issue that confronted him and that is obviously very um, relevant to all of the issues that are confronting California today as well is the prison system. And this is sort of comparing uh, when, when Jerry Brown came into office, the size of the prison system, 20,000 inmates, 11 state prisons, and a very small fraction of the state budget. Now, this begins to change during even his first term, where by 1979, when he's reelected, the prison population has jumped 13%, and the numbers of men getting admitted to prison is up by 75%. And that growth prompts him to, pr to propose uh, what becomes a, a building spree for California, uh, somewhat to the benefit of the Central Valley, um, where he proposes building 10 new prisons by the end of the time that he's, he's his second term as governor. A lot of what was driving this and what has driven the growth in incarceration, the enormous growth in, in incarceration in California to this day was the switch from indeterminate sentencing to determinate sentencing, which took away um, the, the discretion of judges to set sentences that, um, within, a, within a certain range. And the rationale for doing that at the time in California was one of many, many states that did this, was that 
um, because having indeterminate sentencing led to great racial disparities because of the subjective nature of the decisions that were made and was, was sending more black and brown men to prison. Um, and it was thought that determinant sentencing would be a way to address that, which it didn't. Um, but what it did do was set in motion this enormous wave of legislation where the legislature passed, specific, because they now could pass legislation with specific terms attached to various crimes. They began to do that. There was, it, we coincided with the sort of real rise in the law and order mentality, not just in California, but obviously in the country and enhancements and sentences became longer and longer. And the three strikes law was passed in California in 1994. So all of this, that sort of enormous growth in incarceration in California begins while Jerry Brown is governor and then continues through the 80s and through the 90s. Um, by the time Jerry Brown left office in 1980, at the end of 1982, um, he, was, uh, he, he had come in as one of the most popular governors in modern times since polling began. And by the time he left office, he was one of the least popular. He had run for president two times. He lost a race for the US Senate to Pete Wilson in 1982 and goes off for a period of a number of years in what are what his friends refer to as the wilderness years in which he does various things, sort of always trying to get back into politics in one way or another. When Rose Bird was recalled, he was in Japan studying and practicing Zen Buddhism. He became chair of the state party in 1989 as another sort of attempt to get back into politics. And then in 1992, made his third and final run for president foreshadowing some of the Howard Dean and even Bernie Sanders um, echoes where he ran with a 1-800 number where people called to contribute money. He did not take contributions above $100. Uh, he lasted sort of to the end in the Democratic primary against Bill Clinton. Who political junkies may remember some of the Clinton Brown debates and if not, you may wanna look them up. They're quite, quite interesting and entertaining. Um, and he's basically, you know, leaves the convention in 1992, finished in politics, um, except that, as we know, he wasn't. And what he does in order to reinvent himself in a very California way is move from San Francisco to Oakland. This is a photo of him on the roof garden, the organic garden uh, of the sort of commune that he formed in Oakland in an effort to build a community. He hosted a weekly radio show and he also began to sort of plot his next political move, which was to run for mayor of Oakland in 1998. Uh, I believe this is when he was um, elected mayor of Oakland in 1998. And um, being, in, being in mayor of Oakland really uh, in, influences his views and thinking about criminal justice in major, major ways that will come to play once he is again in state office and enabled to, to influence them. And the reason that the experience of being mayor, one of the main reasons that it's such a formative time for him is that he skipped all of the experience of being a local office holder that most politicians go through, whether it's a city council or a local mayor or a county supervisor. And he you know, jumped into politics as secretary of state because of his name, because he was Edmund Gerald Brown Jr. And that was a very well na known name in, in California. So being mayor really exposes him to all of the, the issues that confront local officials. And being mayor in Oakland at this time, um, the, the primary issue, the first issue that everybody was concerned about was uh, crim criminal justice related. Oakland had one of the highest homicide rates in the country at that point. And it, it also had, as the rest of California did, an incredibly high recidivism rate. So he begins to walk the streets of Oakland during his campaign and in his early months and, and years as mayor, and um, confront the issues of criminal justice in, in two different ways. And there's a, I'm gonna play a short clip here where he talks about 
his first during the campaign, what it was like learning for him for him hearing about people's concerns. I heard was people talk about crime, the dope dealers on the corner. Somebody put a gun in my back. I never met people who had a gun put in their back. And uh, you know, not once or twice, but frequently I talked in these meetings or listened to people who were the victims of crime. Yeah, they don't like it. So that certainly got my attention. Anybody else? This is the kickoff to our summer events. So that got his attention, but something else about, and, and, and he sort of had a tough on crime persona as trying to do something to, to improve the, the, the system in, 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 in Oakland, but the, it got his attention in another way too. And that was his beginning to understand what the impact was of the California prison system. And the fact that locking people up and viewing prisons purely as something that was about punishment, which was very much how he had thought about them in his first tenure as governor, where he talked about, he sort of made really um, almost derogative comments about people who wanted to talk about their mothers and talk about psychiatrists. And you know, this was an issue of crime and punishment. It was not about rehabilitation. But then he begins to see in Oakland that as he would say, most of these people are coming out and they're coming back and they're coming into your community. And if nothing is done to help them while they're in prison, uh, as this quote says, it's a treadmill, it's a merry-go-round, it's a scandal. And he began to refer to the prison system as postgraduate schools of crime. One in 14 men in Oakland at the time he was mayor were either on parole or probation. So Oakland begins to really change the way he also thinks about what should be the nature of the prison system in California. Um, all right, as you know, he then is in a position to actually do something about that. He goes, parlays his tenure in the you know most unlikely resurgence of a political career. He goes from being mayor of Oakland to being attorney general, um, holding up his the photo of his father when he was elected on election night. And four years later is elected governor. This is a photo from the election night celebration in Oakland at the Fox Theater with his wife and Gus Brown. Um, the, so he had comes in with a second chance to do, you know, it's, I mean, sort of, again, I, uh, to me, a very California story that someone who had done all of the things that he had done his first time around has had all this time, comes back, was the youngest governor, comes back as the oldest governor in the history of California in a, you know, very different, different time period in a different era and a different way in which we're thinking about criminal justice but also he's in a different place and has a more mature view and has also learned, thought about and learned from the things that, um, that he did the first time. So one of the things he does is once again, um, focus on remaking the California Supreme Court. He's in the fortunate position of having four appointments during his eight years as governor in Jerry Brown 2.0 um, and very determined, obviously, not to um, make any of the mistakes that he made the first time. He appointed the following four people here, Goodwin Liu, Mariana Florentino Cuellar, and Leandra Kruger, all of whom were Yale Law School graduates. And then in the very final weeks of his administration, he appointed Josh Groban, who had been uh, Brown's advisor on judicial appointments up until that time. Um, he deviates from the other three because he was a graduate of Harvard Law School as opposed to Yale. Um, and as you can see, they're all young. They're all uh, very rigorous intellectual scholars and are likely to really, you know, I think we, we haven't seen yet what the impact of the, the Brown court will be, but we're gonna, you know, the, that, that will be a, a fertile ground for scholars to research for, for many years to come. Um, altogether, in terms of his judges, 
And in California at the time, I, I probably still, but at the time that he was governor had uh, twice the number of judges in total as the entire federal system. Um, he, Brown appointed, if you count all four of his terms, more than 1200 judges, which is three quarters of the total. I was not that they all served at the same time, but you know, his impact on the judiciary and shaping it uh, is just enormous. And there were lots and lots of firsts over the course of the, the second two terms um, of different ethnicities, um, different sexual identities, different genders, um, and lots of lots of lots of firsts in, in lots of courts around the country. Um, the other thing that he confronts, of course, is the California state prison system. Again, the numbers from 1975, and then you can see when he comes back into office in 2011, the you know incredible growth in the system. And California had been sued for an litigation that went on for many years over the inhumane conditions in the prison system because it was so overcrowded and the medical care was so bad that the federal government, the federal judge rather, actually did appoint a receiver for the, to oversee the health system in the prisons, uh, which is still, still in effect. Um, so he has the other, the other thing he inherits when he comes back into office in 2011 is a $26 billion deficit. So he has both a financial incentive to do something about reducing that $8 billion that's being spent on the prison system. And he is ultimately under court order from the US Supreme Court. He does fight that the, the, the case up until the US Supreme Court, but ultimately um, has to find ways to reduce the prison system. And um, the, 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 what follows over the course of the eight years is a, a series of actions that are taken both by him as, as executive actions by through propositions that he champions and that are passed by, by, popular, by popular vote and through legislation, um, which also he spearheaded as well, that, that all of which go to um, general, the general topic um, or general, has a general impact of reducing both the harshness of sentences that were passed during all of that period of time during which our prison system grew, during the, rock, the, the drug laws, the incredibly long sentences, the three strikes laws, all of that. Um, there are a whole series of actions that, that are taken um, through all of the mechanisms that I described to ameliorate those sentences and particularly a focus on youth. And here again, there are sort of echoes of his father here, but building on the idea that there's growing evidence that the brains of young people are not fully formed in some ways, um, he begins to really focus on ways to go back and give second chances to people, to provide opportunities for parole for people, uh, who were, were denied in under other circumstances to lessen sentences and um, uh, to, in general, um, uh, make the system uh, to try to roll back so many of the very harsh things that were done over the course of the years that built up the prison system. Um, he, this is a, a, a very Jerry Brown quote. Um, where he was talking, this was at a, at a forum where he was encouraging employers to hire people who came out of prison. And he said, I helped screw things up, but I helped unscrew them. Um, and a lot of this is driven by his belief in um, the power of redemption and the importance of giving people second chances. And again, something that really harkens back to his father as well. And here's a short, on that. I've been brought up the idea of, of forgiveness and redemption. The, the essence of Christianity is redemption. That, that's what Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. That's what it's all about. So those who say, um, once you commit certain crimes, you are forever, for 10, 20, 30, 50, 70, 80 years, that's it. Uh, that really does uh, run afoul of not only Christianity, 
but our whole American tradition, and, and just plain common sense. Because the proposition of, of the DAs is, we know on the day we charge, or on the day of the judge sentences, everything that can occur, we know all we need to know for the next 50 years. And all I'm saying is, you might have had some very good ideas there in the charges and the verdict that came in. But over the passage of time, men change, women change. And those changes ought to be accommodated so that we can open up the cells for new people that are even more dangerous. Redem so perhaps the clearest um, evidence of the way in which that played out and, and changed um, so many lives in such significant ways in California uh, are the number of clemencies that Governor Brown issued, um, particularly in his last two years in office. And if you look at his first two terms, 400 pardons, 404 and one commutation, and in his last two terms in office, he issued 1,332 pardons and 285 commutations. Many of them dealt with um, men generally or women as well who had committed crimes when they were very young and been sentenced to these incredibly long terms. Um, many, some of them were pardons for immigrants who faced the danger of deportation. He spent many, many hours uh, reading files and thinking about these issues, took them incredibly seriously and was still issuing uh, commutations up to, I think, basically his last hours in the office in December of um, 2018. Uh, so then he retired to Calusa. Um, this is the same land that you saw on the first slide where his great grandfather settled. Um, Jerry Brown built um, Mountain House Three, as he calls it, which is the Mountain House was the inn that his great grandfather ran um, and re returned to his ancestral home. Um, but he has stayed active and interested and, and engaged in criminal justice issues. And in particular, most recently, a photo that he tweeted from his voting on election day. And in the old fashioned way, he went and cast his ballot in person. Um, he had campaigned and done, it, done some commercials and spent some of his money from that he had it, uh, in his campaign chest to help to ensure that Proposition 20 was defeated. Proposition 20 would have rolled back a lot of those changes that he was instrumental in, um, in enacting. And here you see, I think in many ways, kind of the essence of his feelings about criminal justice, that most people believe that human beings can turn their lives around if given the chance. So I'm gonna stop on that note and, um, turn it back to you, Miriam, for questions. Thank you all. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Miriam. That was a wonderful overview of the governor's ground and their 24 years in office and the uh, impact that they had, especially on the judiciary, as well as uh, the, the criminal justice system in general. So thank you so much. And I, again, would invite you to type your question in. If you click the button, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, it will prompt you to uh, type a question there. And as I said, we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. So the first one is uh, from someone whose name we don't have, but it's, it says, it's fascinating that Rose Bird was a public defender and Governor Jerry Brown continued to appoint public defenders in his second round. I'm not sure people realize how unusual this is. Federal and state executives overwhelmingly appoint former prosecutors. Hopefully Biden will follow Jerry's lead on this. Um, yeah, his appointing, I mean, he talked a little bit in one of those interviews that I, I ran a clip from about how it had become, in the, particularly in the 1990s, that, be, that the route to becoming a judge in California was to be a prosecutor, to be um, a deputy um, district attorney. And that he really believed that, again, an, an, a, a way that the courts needed to reflect the diversity of society 
was in bringing people, lawyers into the, uh, um, putting lawyers on the bench who came from different walks of life. And that um, in particular appointed public defenders, um, which was, I didn't say if it would be controversial, but I get, I mean, there certainly, it was, certainly was as the questioner points out, it was unusual and, and continues to be unusual. And um, we will see also whether Governor Newsom follows that pattern. He's not had that many appointments, partly because um, Governor Brown worked until the very last minute. And the reason that he didn't appoint um, Justice Groban to the court until the very last moment he left a, that he left that seat vacant for a long time was that he filled every last judgeship that he could before he left office. Um, so we definitely have a, a far more diverse bench than, um, than than we used to and that many and then and and also compared to many other states. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is from Jennifer. The political legacy of Jerry Brown seems rather exceptional compared to other state leaders. What was the hook in Brown's career that inspired you to study the Brown's political and personal family history? So um, I guess that's, a, that's another, I'll answer that by, I, by sort of talking about why I wrote the book and how I came to write it. I had done other California books as Dr. Vivian mentioned that were about Cesar Chavez who also intersected with Jerry Brown in a fairly significant way during their tenure. Um, but ultimately um, I'm, a, I'm, a Cal, I'm a transplant from New York. So I always say to Pim, I can't, I can't see any of you out there, but I always say, don't hold that against me. I, you know, I, I, I made the right decision. I came here, um, and partly I think because I did not grow up here and I didn't learn California history, I, I find it completely fascinating and really have wanted to find more ways to dig in to tell that story. And in 2015, when he was in, um, taking office for his fourth and final term, um, in his State of the State address, Governor Brown talked about his great grandfather, August Schaffman, whose photo I showed, and about the history of his family coming to the country, um, Im immigrating to, to California in the, in the 19th century and settling on this land. Um, there is a diary that August Schaffman kept when he crossed, um, when he crossed the plains in 1852 and Brown read from part of that during his state of the state address. And he talked about his own desire to go back and settle on this land as he has since done. And I was very just taken by the idea of the sweep of that and the way in which in some ways the arc of his family mirrors the history of the state of California, which became a state in 1850. Um, and just curious really about his decision. I don't know how many people who are watching this or listening um, have been to Calusa, but it's not a place that most people in California would consider a, a garden spot of the state or choose to live in if they could live anywhere in California. And so I was really interested in his just wanting to go back there to settle and um, when to talk to him about that. And I met with him for the first time um, on that land when there was nothing there except for a couple of barns. And in the conversation that we had there, he talked about his family and he talked about his father. And I, in listening to him, just began to think of the, the way that, you know, the, the incredible impact that the family had and the fact that very little had really been written about that. There is one um, very comprehensive biography of Pat Brown. Uh, and so uh, it, it seemed to me that the family was a vehicle to tell a particular history of California and also to look at the ways in which they had this really enormous impact in, in so many ways and so many realms on shaping um, the, the, the state that we, that we live in and, and its history. Thank you very much. Uh, this one is, um, a question maybe others are interested in, and I can answer it perhaps. Uh, I would love to rewatch this. Will we have access to the recording? And yes, the event is being recorded and we should be able, I don't know how many days it might take, maybe not long at all, but 
should be able to put it on the Public History Institute webpage and the Kegley Institute of Ethics also has a YouTube page or YouTube channel or their page can can carry this link as well. So um, we should be able to get it out, I would say, within the next few days. The next question is, uh, and that was from Jamie. This is anonymous. Uh, it was interesting to me that Jerry, in a signing statement on not trying 14 to 15 year olds as adults said, to paraphrase, it's not about them, what they did. It's about what kind of society do we want to be? Is that similar to his view on the death penalty? Um, I'm not sure exactly which signing statement that refers to, um, but uh, I don't know that he would have said it was not about, um, or, 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 or that, that he didn't take into account the nature of crimes that people committed, he did. And he um, thought about them a lot and, and talked to lots of people in each of the cases. He spent a lot of time on each of the case files that came before him for potential, um, potential commutation, certainly, um, none of which were death penalty cases, by the way. Um, but it, um, I'm just trying to think of how to how to answer this. I mean, it, it is about how that, that how we treat people is about the society that we are, but also that it, it's not. I don't think he he's, he would say that it was not about the crime that was committed, but that people were, should not be reduced to the essential the essence, essentiality of that crime you know i think that you heard what he said about that people people have an ability to change and that something that someone did particularly when they were a teenager say um that 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 was that should not define them for the rest of their life um and and how we treat people is 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 a measure of that um one of the things i didn't get to, to didn't mention is that the prison system has also shifted and this is in line with other systems as well and the other prisons in, 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 in the national trend but there is a lot more emphasis on rehabilitation in prison now there are or were before covid um, college courses offered in i think maybe all but one of the prisons which is new um, and in general there, the, the, there, even the, the definition of punishment um, of, the, the, of the criminal justice system is, was changed in the law some number of years ago to say that it was not purely about punishment, but also about rehabilitation. So I think that you know, his evolving views reflected also to some, to some, to some degree uh, our evolving views as a society. I mean, one of the things that, that is not specific to him, but I think is important to remember in the, the context of this whole conversation is that I, the statistic is that half of the people in the United States now, because of this enormous expansion of the prison system that's gone on everywhere, half of the people in the United States have a relative or a loved one who is either either in or has been in prison. And so when you think about that, it, it makes sense that people's views of what it means to be in prison have also changed and evolved. Uh, on the death penalty, which was the question um, specifically, he has been anti-death penalty. Um, he consistently from his young days from protesting outside the prison during one of the, the, um, the executions and obviously in the call to his father, um, he did not campaign, um, as I recall, uh, he did not take a, an active position on the last, most recent referendum to repeal the death penalty, which did not pass. Um, I think that he felt that there were other um, issues that he really wanted to still get through on the criminal justice system. I mean, one of the important ones that I didn't mention, uh, which was also one of the last bills that he signed as governor in the fall of 2018 was, a, a bill that came out of the legislature, but he was very active in championing it, which was to change the definition of felony murder, um, which had an enormous impact on 
people who are in prison now as well, because it is not only prospective, but retroactive. Felony murder meant that you could be charged with first degree murder and, and sent away for you know, 25 years um, for being an accessory to a murder, even if you didn't even necessarily know that the murder was taking place at the time. Um, so there were things that um, he, and I, I'm, this is a roundabout answer, but, but part of the reason that he did not take a more active stance on the death penalty referendum per se was a political calculation on his part that there were other issues, um, the propositions at the time and other legislation still that he wanted to get through and um, it was a balancing act. I'm not, I hope that answered the question. That was a little roundabout, sorry. No, oh, thank you. This is from Jason and this and the next one are both a little bit longer, but uh, it, it's essentially has to do with the consistency of Brown in his um, evaluations of, of those who might deserve commutations or not. So in one of those interviews, uh, I recall from hearing it earlier, after arguing the rationale from Christianity and American values for forgiveness, he notes that people like Sirhan Sirhan, quote, ain't never getting out. And he also has repeatedly denied parole to people who have shown transform lives like Leslie Van Houten. So the question is, why is he inconsistent in how he appro appropriates some things like forgiveness or belief in a second chance for some people and not others? <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, I'm. I, I don't think that I'm qualified to answer that question particularly because that's sort of going inside his mind in ways that that I can't do, and I and don't. I don't. I don't have any great insight on that, Jason. Beyond what what I think you already know, um, which is that you know people people are inconsistent, and um, I think he would argue that, I mean, he, he has argued that there are rationales for all of his decisions. I don't know that he has explicitly um, explained that. I, um, my dentist actually has asked me frequently about Leslie Van Houten um, and why um, parole has been denied. And, and actually, I think that Gavin Newsom just denied parole this year as well. Um, so, you know, there are things in people's prison records that we don't see that are not public. Um, and I, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not taking a position on the rightness or wrongness of Governor Brown's actions on this. I would only say that, uh, you know, by way of explanation, that I think he would argue that he spends a lot of time reviewing the files and the people's behavior and weighing those issues. Um, and it will tell you, for example, when um, the the last remaining. Um, uh, um, was it the SLA? The it was the person who was convicted of um, um, who was convicted in connection with the the murder of Marcus Garvey, the Oakland superintendent. And when that person came up for um, for a, for a clemency request, um, he talked to the um, Marcus Garvey's daughter. Um, and to a whole bunch of people who were involved in, in that case before making a decision. And I think that was sort of typical of his, of his method. So um, yeah, people are inconsistent, but uh, I think he would argue that he had his rationale in all the decisions that he made. Hey, thank you. This is from uh, one of my department colleagues, Kieran, and she says first, thank you, Miriam, for this wonderful and fascinating talk. Uh, these actually both have to do with uh, Brown and Oakland. Oh, I, have two, I have two questions. Um, I'm thinking about Jerry Brown's time in office during the declining years of Oakland's Black Power Movement, which resulted in the incar incarceration of many people with ties to groups like the Black Panther Party throughout the 1970s. Has Jerry Brown played a role in current discussions about the movement to pardon political prisoners from this Black Power era? And two, did he live in the Oakland commune or solely help establish it? <laughs> okay, I can answer two. One um, <laughs> is a tough question. Um, it is a really interesting, I mean, he, he gets elected in 1998 with 
more votes from the black community than all of the black candidates combined. And he's the first white mayor of Oakland in I think about 20 years. Um, so it was a, was a really interesting time. Um, and it was, as you say, the sort of the declining years of, of that, the, the black power movement in Oakland. Um, I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I, I actually really just don't know the answer to the first question as to whether he's been involved in any of those conversations. Um, I, I kind of doubt that he'd be involved in any of them now because, you know, but I, I don't know. Um, but I can't answer the Oakland question. He did live in the commune. Um, he built a commune, it had like 10 or 12 bedrooms, I think. Um, he, he has always, and I write about this a lot in the book, um, it's interesting because he is in some ways such an atypical successful politician. He does not, he rejected his father's whole sort of, his father was the ultimate old style back slapping, baby kissing, parade waving politician. Um, you know, incredibly gregarious, always talking to people. I meet a lot of people still who will say that they were in an elevator at one point with Pat Brown. And by the time the elevator went from the ground floor up to wherever it was going, he had introduced himself and met everyone in the elevator. He was just that kind of a bubbly personality. Um, his son, as I'm sure most people know, is sort of very much not like that. However, he's always been very interested in community whether it was the Jesuit community, whether it was the Zen community. Um, and then he did attempt to create this com commune in Oakland. Um, it didn't really kind of work. He um, had trouble getting people to eat together and things like that. Um, but he absolutely did live there uh, until some point when he lived, he was still living there when he was elected mayor, I think. And then he moved to a loft in, um, 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 Midtown Oakland? I almost forget what it's called, sorry. It's, it was the old Sears building, I believe. Um, and, and he was, I, I think Oakland was just a very formative time for him. He also founded two charter schools in Oakland, which are still there, the Oakland Military Institute and the Oakland School for the Arts, very involved, continues to be very involved with them to this day. Um, and yeah, Oakland was important. Okay, uh, thank you. This is from Destiny. Um, did did uh, he reach his goal? Did the definition of murder change? This is a reference to your earlier discussion of Jerry Brown and uh, the felony murder, I think, and to whether anything, uh, did that policy or that law about felony murder, I think that's what's being asked, or did that change? So yes, absolutely. The felony murder law did change. He signed that into law in September of 2018. Um, it is, is, it's a very active issue right now because as I said, it, it applies retroactively as well. So there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people in the prison system who were sentenced under um, these very draconian laws that apply to felony murder, who now are eligible to apply to be resentenced. And many have already gotten out of prison. It's been going up into the courts on appeal and all of the appeals have upheld both the prospective and the retrospective nature of the law. So it was a, a hugely significant change. Good to know. Oh, I like the next question. Yeah, so actually Nadia has two questions and I'm really glad she asked the second one, um, which I'll maybe take first, just because I meant to say something earlier about Miriam Powell's most recent book, The Browns of California. Uh, and she asks, how do we buy the book? And I noted um, in a little searching that it's available both in hardbound and Kindle editions. And I don't know Miriam and paperback. Will add any more about accessing the book. Sure, it's, av it's available in paperback too. Um, yeah, yeah. And you can buy it anywhere. Um, I love to encourage people to buy from independent bookstores. There is also um, a bookshop, which is now sort of trying to set itself up as an online alternative to Amazon. But if you want to buy it on Amazon, I'm, I'm okay with that too. I um, <laughs> make my peace with that. Um, uh, so, and yeah, and 
how to, um, and I, I would be, I'd love to assign books for people. I don't quite know how to do that, but um, if you, I have a website, um, it's mariampowell.com. There's a lot more information about the book there. And there's also an email address for me there. Um, feel free to email me and email me with any questions that you have that don't get answered or that occur to you. Or if you read the book, I, I love to hear from readers and just hear what people think. I think um, I would encourage everyone to write to authors, not just me, but um, the authors really like to hear from people who read books. Sometimes, sometimes you think that no one has read your book other than your family and your friends. And so it's always really nice to to hear from people. So, um, and, and if someone, if there's a way to work out a way to logistically sign books, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to do that. Right. Maybe post pandemic, there'll be some opportunity or uh, you can communicate Hopefully. by email to see if you can work something out. Uh, Nadia has this question as well. How do you feel about cameras in the courtroom? Um, well, as a journalist, I'm always in favor of access to anything. So I'm, I'm in favor of cameras in the courtroom, um, but, uh, but it's not something I've really thought a lot about. Okay. This is um, an, an anonymous question, very interesting personal, uh, personal question. I went to the women's prison in Chowchilla near the end of Jerry Brown's term. Some women there told me in a prayer group, they prayed for Jerry every night. I thought if anyone appreciated that, he might. His commutations and legislation had a powerful impact on people. So more a comment really than a question, but. Um, um, that's, that's, that's really very powerful. And I'm sure that um, he would really appreciate that. Uh, I, I do think he, um, you know, he took all of that work um, incredibly seriously. And I, I think, I mean, I was really glad to have this opportunity to talk about his record on criminal justice in part because I think that it's gotten not as much attention as it should. Um, the, the historian in me and the, the, this, the narrative storyteller in me likes the sweep, you know, much as I said that I was attracted to the book and to writing about the family because of the way in which um, they mirror the history of California and and the, the things that it allowed me to tell. Um, but in particular, um, his actions and his beliefs and his impact for good and bad on the criminal justice system um, over the course of what, from 75, 1975 till 2018, however many years that is, um, it just, it's, it's, I think it's a very powerful story. It says a lot about about human emotions. And I think it says a lot about him and his character. And one of the reasons I put that picture from the seminary in there also is because his Jesuit training and background, he went to a Jesuit high school, um, is also a very kind of powerful part of his personal motivation. I think, I hope that you heard that a little bit in, um, in, in some of the clips, um, but I too have, I have met um, some of the people who are out of prison now because he uh, commuted their sentences and um, it's, it's sort of very, they're living productive lives. I will also just to tie this back to his father in, in Pat Brown's book about the death penalty, he writes about um, visiting and having someone come to his office whose sentence he commuted, who had been on death row and who later actually got out of prison on parole and was leading a, a, a you know, good productive life. Uh, many of the, or at least some of the people that Jerry Brown commuted have been very active now in criminal justice reform and in trying to help people who are coming out and to improve the reentry opportunities and systems um, for in, uh, for men and women who are coming out of the prison today. So I, I think the fact that women prayed for him at Chowchilla um, would make him happy. Okay. I don't see any other questions and we are moving in or closing in on our end time here. So I want to remind you that uh, Michael Burroughs has posted uh, several things in the chat that you have access to. 
including the link to go ahead and evaluate uh, uh, the talk or take a survey for Cal Humanities, as it were. And you can um, open that and have it on your screen before we, we end our webinar. Um, he's also provided here, and he just put it up again, um, the grant name Humanities Beyond Bars. And he's also provided uh, a link on Amazon for Miriam Powell's book, uh, Should You Be Interested, as well as her web page. So um, lots of good information there. Thank you, Michael, for providing that. And uh, thank you for your collaboration, Michael. And uh, I'm sure Michael joins me in thanking uh, Miriam Powell for taking this time to share her insights. Uh, it's, it's a beautifully written book. It's incredibly engaging. The style is wonderful. And I, I, I'm glad that we had this opportunity for you to share what you've researched and the, 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 the mind full of information about the Browns and, and especially for this um, event focused uh, on the grant that we could look at uh, their influence on the criminal justice system and the policies and uh, ideas even about, as you said, in, in, in some place, beliefs and principles uh, that they brought to their governorships. So uh, thank you so much. Again, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much for attending. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much to Public History Institute in Cambridge.